All right, everybody, welcome back to the King's Table. We're finishing off the year. This is maybe our last episode of 2023. Uh, again, my name is Ashish Nathu. Thank you guys all for being here. I am joined with my good friends, Maddie Adjison, Aaron Amuchastegui, and the sage Mike Ayala. Good to see you guys. Um, super excited. I, I just want to say before we get into a few topics, I don't know if you guys have been watching our YouTube channel, but the YouTube channel is blowing up and the engagement is fantastic. I saw Mooch comment on some stuff. Mike commented on some stuff. Like it, Maddie, somebody commented on your hair last time. Like, oh, it's dang, been super I fun. I, I think, yeah, I think Mooch's <laughs> guidance of just sticking to, to, um, to YouTube. Off. I don't know if it's going to fully pay off, but I will say it is fun to be able to engage with our audience and to see everyone's comments and talk back. And so I just appreciate that. Uh, please, everybody who's listening, continue guys to do that. We will keep responding. We really want feedback. And so it's just really fun. That's it for me on that. I'm going to, I'm going to put the guys on the spot, but I think we should do a meetup in 2024 in one Ooh. of our cities. And we should do a live podcast with a live audience and do a little mastermind afterwards. That Done. would be a fun goal. That'd be great. Yeah, you, you don't got to yeah. do for that one. If you're listening, you guys can vote, whether that's in California or Texas. We'll we'll do it in one of our states. Give us some feedback on where you guys want us to do, what you guys want us, what, what does that look like for you? What do you want to get out of it? But that's a great well, idea, Mikey. I love that. If, here, if here's, you vote here's Austin, I'll go like your Instagram page too and share one. Me, me too. Me too. <laughs> if we and vote California. <laughs> The, well, the problem with that, back to the last episode, which if you haven't listened to it, go check it out. If we do it in California and this thing blows up, we're going to get taxed on it. So let's do it in Texas. Oh, my God. Damn. You Daddy, know, I wish I could guys, argue man. that point, and I can't. But what I can say is yeah. Napa, Napa Valley and my connections out there are getting pretty world class. Mm. And mm. it might be worth hosting it somewhere in Napa because I've got some great estate connections to do it on a winery, maybe on a vineyard. We wine taste all day and then go out for an epic dinner <sighs> and mastermind later that evening. Just saying. That's my right, well, on top, on top, That's why he's the hero of hospitality. The hero has of hospitality has spoken. The hero will do cryotherapy at my house if uh, you guys come out to Austin <laughs> after you sign a I'll, waiver. I'll get a cold so, and but hey, vote now, state. people. We're good. Vote now. Drop, the, drop uh, the comments. And if, if, if you buy the VIP ticket, then we'll go wake surfing too, if it's Ooh. in Austin. Well, look, we, look got, we got a lot of a stuff to talk better. about today. Um, I think that's a great idea. I think just more engagement with our audience and is exactly what we want to be able to do and learn how to live life bigger together. So um, I, let's start with some economic news. Let's, let's kind of catch up a little bit about the things we we're talking about last time too. And then we have some other... Um, grab bag topics we want to bring up. Um, last week, just super fascinating how the market is responding to this. Last week, Jerome Powell uh, held rates, didn't increase them, signaled pretty clearly that in 2024, there's going to be at least three reductions yep. planned, which not sometimes least, means- Like ING said, not well, six, like ING said. Could, it could be more than three. Apparently, his, it's going to be. Uh, I heard somewhere where they, when they say three, they really mean four or five. But either way, uh, it's a signal. The stock market has has uh, performed like crazy in the last five or six, seven days. So they're taking that as a very optimistic direction. Growth stocks are flying through the roof. Um, I think some of these tech stocks are at highest records ever. I think Amazon hit a record last week. So just wanted to see what you guys thought besides the obvious, uh, what's what's being signaled here, um, anything different than what we've talked about previously. Um, yeah. You know, I think that the assumption of reducing rates and controlling inflation and job rates, all this stuff kind of comes into it. We're still at record unemployment, prices for housing as high as it's ever, well, it's, it's high, let's call it, interest rates are high. Um, reducing the cost of money doesn't necessarily mean prices are going to come down. In fact, you can make an argument that prices are going to go up. Um, another piece of data that I, I just actually spoke to a couple of bankers last week uh, in terms of private equity, I'm sorry, investment banking. 
And they said that the private equity market of com- people buying and selling companies is down over 50%. And interest rates are not helping that. But just because interest rates come down doesn't mean prices of companies go down. There's going to be more demand. There's a lot of gunpowder waiting waiting to go buy companies, and prices for companies are actually going to go up. So it's kind of interesting, right? Everyone's sort of waiting for the fallout, waiting for opportunity. But you can also argue that in the next 6 to 12 months, assets that we're talking about, buying businesses, buying real estate, are actually going to go the opposite direction. And in fact, stocks are also going to keep going up too. So is the best time to get into opportunity now. Anyways, that's how I wanted to start it. Maybe we go we go into the the group. Let's start with uh, let's start with Mikey. Well, I I don't know you know I don't know exactly you know where we're headed with real estate, but I think it just kind of reinforces a conversation that we've been having. When you look at the S and P, and there's an article right now on Bloomberg and people's projections, and when you look at the market in general, the projections going into 2024 are great. And even everybody's projections for the market over 2024 are pretty stellar too. What does that mean for real estate? I think there's still some debate to be had there because as, as optimistic as I am, um, you know, I think there's some challenges still ahead for, for real estate in general, but I think it reinforces a conversation that we've been having on how much does real estate matter in the big picture now and really looking at that GDP in, in a comparison, which we brought up like three episodes ago. But I think that's something that I've really been kind of anchoring on because I don't know that real estate, I'm not saying that there isn't challenges ahead, there is, but I don't know that everything that's going on right now signals that real estate is going to be strong hmm. as much as it signals that maybe, you know, other sectors in the economy are going to perform well. And, and again, reinforces maybe a conversation that we've started to have, like how much does real estate matter in the big picture compared to what it did 10 years ago. Now for present company included, and many of our friends, um, real estate is a big, big, big percentage of our investment in our portfolio. So it matters heavily to us in our echo chambers. But I'm just wondering, you know, when you look at uh, what's going on out there and how, I guess, rosy some of these projections are with the economy in general, I think it just reinforces the idea and the argument that we've been having that maybe real estate doesn't matter as much. It doesn't mean that the trickle down effect doesn't mean that it doesn't affect um, you know regional banks and and some of the challenges in the industry. And it doesn't mean that some you know real estate operators don't get wiped out and that maybe appreciation in real estate is not going to be what it has been in the past. But maybe it doesn't matter as much. I'm not saying it doesn't matter at all. But I'm not saying maybe I'm saying it doesn't matter as much as it has in the past. And and I think we have to kind of separate those conversations because. I think a lot of it was bundled together in the past. And, and again, um, I think the market's set for a rally. I'm, I'm even considering, you know, as you diversify out of, you know, what I've been traditionally 85, 90% real estate, you know, how do I, how do I kind of balance some of that out? And maybe it is some exposure to markets, which I haven't had in the past. I've even been listening to Matty A's podcast because he brings on a guest regularly that talks about the markets. And I've been the guy that's always been like, I don't understand it. I don't get it. I can make more money in real estate, but maybe, maybe I have to shift some of my thinking and maybe it's, you know, as we preach for so long, maybe it's not me getting active in trading. Maybe it's teaming up with, you know, the people that I know that would do some of that for me. So I'm just, I'm kind of shifting the way that I've thought about a lot of things for the last 10 years, based on what we've been talking about the last few weeks. I wonder why, they made the announcement, meaning I wonder why the Fed said, hey, we're going to do three drops next week because here's because as a result, market takes off, stocks take off, pricing goes back up, people get more bullish now, which is great, right? Like, but what ends up happening now, if stocks start taking off, right, the inflation ratings that we're going to allow him to reduce are going to be canceled. Does that make sense? Like the, because he's saying they're going to drop now, stocks are going to go higher than they would have otherwise. And so now they're going to say, wait, inflation isn't as tame as we thought. Now we can't make the drops that we had. So I'm really surprised by their actions that they've been making over the past, you know, year, 18 months that they would actually forecast, Hey, in six months, we're going to do a drop because we think that inflation is getting tamed right now, because the only thing that was going to happen was the, was the market was going to start ripping and roaring and it's gonna it's gonna hurt 
it, it's essentially it's going to it's going to contradict the stats that they did before. So I think that whether he was going to do it or not, I don't think they should have made the announcement because I think by making the announcement, they're going to have a chance of it actually canceling. So that that's my first thought on it is why if they were going to make the drop, they shouldn't have said anything anyway, because by saying something, it's going to make the it's going to make the market soar. And now inflation is going, the inflation factor is going to go back up to like a seven or eight percent inflation factor when they do the test in March. And they're going to say, oh, well, now we can't drop. So anyway, they should have held that one closer to the chest, um, I think, because the markets are pricing in even bigger drops than what they've said. The markets are pricing in like, you know, like multiple uh, drops beyond five or six drops. And so we will see what happens with that. Um, I am I am doubling down too on that thought of, you know, what Mike had mentioned that we talked about a few weeks ago is I still believe that. They're less in, they're less concerned about what's going to happen in real estate as they are with everything else. Part of what happens with the Fed is is the Fed rate affects what normal businesses pay for interest mm-hmm. rates. You know, I've got a buddy that has a huge uh, medical device sales company, right? And when the Fed rate went up so much that it forced one of his banks into cutting off his line of credit into his and the way medical devices work is you sell them to somebody and then six months later you get paid from the insurance company. We had millions of dollars of receivables is in that company. And so they need lines of credit to operate. But when the Fed raised rates so much like that company, so Fed rate coming back down is going to help companies like that, right? To where they can actually get their normal operating because real estate's only a very small portion of that. But again, those other companies are doing, um, you know, okay. You know, when we've been looking at stats. So yeah, my, my, so my first thought on it is, is I still think the Fed is going to, to continue with that policy of they aren't going to think about what's happening with real estate as much as they're thinking about the other stuff um, that they probably made the announcement too soon. I think, I mean, when you look at the stats and the data right now that's coming out, last week there was like a 48% chance of a cut in March, 25 bips. There's a 67.5% chance of a cut in March now. And there's like a 20 something percent chance of a 50 bit cut in March. So I think that historically, this market is a very, this market and and all of the challenges and all the systemic variables that are in play now are very different than what the economic data we've tracked in the past really means for the economy. And it's just a different world post COVID. So I think part of the Fed's challenge is they're also trying to navigate a new kind of paradigm in which they set policy, react to data, and they're kind of, as Aaron has said, and a lot of other people have critiqued the Fed and how they've done it, why they've done it, and how aggressively they did it. Um, and ultimately, it's very interesting to see how now they have kind of shown their their cards a little bit. I'm on the over camp that if they say three, they're most likely going to do four or five. But it's one of those things, too, where I don't feel confident saying that necessarily because there could be data that comes out in Q1 that totally shifts, you know, how they decide to set policy going forward. But that being said, I do think that there is going to be some significant opportunity in commercial real estate investing over the next few years, that writing is already on the wall. I think single family is a different kind of beast that has somewhat of different challenges in the market than maybe commercial does. I think it's still going to remain somewhat competitive. And honestly, I think right now, I was talking about this on you know my show the other day with Ryan, is we think that one of the greatest opportunities is honestly right now. It's between when the Fed is not doing anything and the market has already baked in some opportunity. I mean, what do you think is going to happen in the single family real estate market that is already significantly undersupplied? I think data shows it's down 34% compared to the same week in 2019. So we're still... 34% 34% lower in terms of inventory in 2019 than we are today. So significantly lower inventory still. And even though we have a much slower, you know, I guess, velocity in which the market is moving right now in real estate, what do you think is going to happen when they cut rates? I mean, look what happened. I think they just released another um, study on refis being at 
uh, an all-time high since I think 2000 or uh, 2021. And that was only like 20 basis points dropping, right? So what do you think is going to happen when it drops 25 basis points and then another 25 minutes? It's going to take off. There's going to be more people going after the same amount of inventory. Yeah, housing starts are up. Yes, there's going to be more inventory probably hitting the market at that point in time in 2024. But even then, I think it's prices are going to go up. Competition is going to be crazy. And it's still going to be a challenging single family real estate market. I think there's a big opportunity in, in businesses and the challenges that, I mean, just follow Cody Sanchez. She puts out amazing content in, on it all day long. And how many baby boomers, one, own businesses, two, are retiring over the next three to five years. There's a significant amount of opportunity there. Um, but I think that the Fed is probably going to pull off a soft landing. I, that, that's my stance. I think that there's still going to be some challenges that they have to deal with. Of course, we got the election year. We've got the different wars that are going on. And there's a lot of systemic risks that we just cannot account for. But in terms of is the Fed lowering rates going to be a good thing for people that are looking to build wealth and looking to you know go out there and find opportunities? I think that it's I would prefer that from an investor standpoint, I like rates being higher because now there's more challenges. There's less resources for people to solve those problems. And me as an entrepreneur and a problem solver, I can go out and find opportunities to create win-wins with people in a business deal, in an investment play, in a real estate play. So I personally hope that they don't cut them too aggressively. And I'm curious to see what the repercussions or ripple effects are from that. But I think there's going to be some phenomenal opportunity next year. And you just got to be participating in conversations like these to see it's not going to be a, you know, quarter by quarter conversation. This is a week by week conversation that you got to be on the front lines in these conversations, hearing what people who are actively taking big moves, massive action are doing and compiling as much of that data to figure out what your next steps are in your business or your investing. I think biggest opportunity for people that want to jump in right now on something is land banking, right? Like, cause we have seen really big, cause I can't mm. tell you when the market's coming back. I can't tell you when commercials coming back. I can't tell you when office is coming back because I'm not as rosy as Matt is with it. But what I do know is that the, that land has been discounted really heavily. You know, the land that I'm looking at downtown Austin was 65 million, now 45 million. Can't quite figure out how to make it work. But I also kind of do know if I find a way to buy it for 45 million in the next five or 10 years, it'll be worth 65 again, or in the next 15, it'll be worth 65 again. And so maybe it's not, a, so I think there's big opportunity in land banking because there's a lot of builders and things like that where there have been these heavy adjustments. Anybody can get into it as long as they have staying power because the, the discounts that have happened in land have been more significant than housing. It's amplified by about a three or four X, right? <laughs> so the you know, land when the market's hot goes way, way up. When the market's down, it'll sell for below replacement value. I think there's opportunities to buy land for be below replacement value and just hold and be holding to when those places do come back. You've got a lot less risk in the staying power. So yeah, I don't know when stuff's coming back, but I do think land has corrected enough that you can buy great deals and wait 10 years for your payoff and that'd be good. Matty A, the Jim Crager, bye, bye, bye. Boom, boom, boom. Anything, yeah, Jim? Um, I think it's I'm interesting. I think that, just but. generally, it's interesting. Like we're definitely seeing a trend that real estate and and it is less important to the economy, or perhaps the Fed is signaling that. But it cannot be ignored how in, how amazing the consumer demand continues to be. People are still spending so much bloody money, and I wonder. What is the end tail of that? Unemployment is not dropping. Whatever they do is not dropping. Consumer behavior of spending is not dropping. Our economy is clearly a consumption-based behavior, a uh, consumption-based economy. Um, in the hotel business, everybody is doing something with their hotels or reinvesting in their hotels, spending money in their hotels, improving their services. Um, regardless of the higher debt costs, they're getting it done. If you didn't get it done in the last cycle, you're already probably too late. Um, we're seeing hotel occupancies higher than they've ever been, ADRs higher than they've ever been, travel through airports, the TSA throughput 
uh, of travelers through U.S. airports is higher than 2020, uh, sorry, 2019, by probably like 10%. Now, I, I can't track that whether it's leisure or business, but just the amount of people moving and getting doing things. I also find in, in my circle, um, beyond this circle, in my circle, we are still struggling with work from home. I think you're seeing that in office prices, office real estate, office product is not moving at all. I think people are seeing that that trend is not going away. Um, yeah, just some really interesting opportunities. I disagree on the multifamily. I think uh, I think it's just. I mean, I agree in the sense that it's it's a category that I think is oversaturated, and it's going to just get more and more expensive. Um, and so I'm actually not looking at multifamily anymore. I'm looking at other stuff, but. Office is fascinating too, that nobody is interested and nobody believes that office will recover in the short term. And Mooch, you, you said this a few episodes ago, and I actually disagreed with you, but after doing a lot of digging, picking up the phone and calling, like, and, and me personally and, and the folks that I know are really struggling with keeping people engaged at the office and forcing people to come. So we'll see, we'll see those trends adjust and change. Um, you know, a, a side note on what Aaron said about land banking. I think I brought this up in an early episode, but my son's father-in-law um, works for a big builder in Phoenix. And he used to run like the construction of an entire development, but he got promoted to basically their land man in, in the Arizona Valley. And he was driving me to the airport probably a month and a half ago. I don't remember why we were in, but anyway, he was telling me that his company has specifically told him, go buy every piece of land that you can possibly get your hands on in the Phoenix Valley. And what that means is like, they're buying land on, on that, like not just the outskirts, but like places that are an hour, hour and a half from downtown Phoenix. They're trying to buy every piece of land that they can possibly get their hands on. Um, for the reason that Aaron said, it's land banking, the valley socked in, and whether it's Phoenix, whether it's Austin, whether it's LA, any of these markets that we're scared of as real estate investors because of the high appreciation and then the sudden drops, these are the markets that those long-term investors are looking at for the reason that Aaron said. So I just want to mm -hmm. reinforce, Aaron, what you said. When I hear a guy that I respect, shout out to Bill, um, you know, saying that his company is putting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into land acquisitions that they can just sit on for the next decade, that just shows you what the outlook is long-term on real estate. We may have some seasons where real estate is challenging, but I've said this so many times on webinars and everything else. Maybe we don't know what's going to happen in real estate the next one, two, three years, but I'm pretty much convinced that if you buy a house in Austin, Texas, or the Phoenix Valley, or Seattle, or LA, when you fast forward five years, seven years, 10 years, it's probably going to be a good investment as long as you can lock that capital up, not worry about paying the debt service, and also not really you know, worrying about it from a standpoint of having to time the market and exit at the right time. So I, I just wanted to you know, kind of give a real world example of what Aaron is saying, and I, I agree with it. I don't know if I'm at the place where I want to invest 100 or 500, or actually I did invest $100,000 with a friend of ours. Start buying up um, the land. I, the problem is, it's like if, if you ever played cash flow from Robert Kiyosaki, it's like, you know, you invest in a piece of land that's three million bucks and you have to be able, this is counterintuitive that everything we've been taught. Yeah. 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 I have 550 acres in Elko, Nevada that I bought in 2012 and I bought it for that reason. So maybe I shouldn't say me and a group bought it for 2.1 million. And we literally said then, this is going to be something that we sit on. There was a guy that bought a, a similar size investment on the other side of the mountain. Our views are better. And he bought it like 25 years ago. And he would develop like five 10 acre ranchettes at a time. And it was his retirement. He'd sell like five of them at a time. And that was like his retirement. And so when we bought this piece of property, we looked at it the same. And I can't tell you how many times Kara told me along the way, our share of that payment was like 3000 a month. And she's like, can we stop this payment? And I'm like, no, this isn't a cash flow play. This is a long-term investment. And now that land is paid off and it's just sitting there. And I don't even think about it to the point where I just a few minutes ago said, I don't know if I would invest in something like that, but I did. And you did. But it's like, it's my 401k, <laughs> baby. Yeah. 
It's such a good point it. though, right? Because when you think about real estate as an as an investment as a whole, anybody that bought a real estate property in 2000 and, you know, let 2008 be the determiner of how they felt about real estate versus the people who mm. rode that out, did it intelligently, and they're looking at 2023, 2008 didn't mean shit to those people because they just rode it out. And they're in a much higher position, you know, today than they were when they bought it probably in 2000. So I agree with that. I was looking at one of, I was fortunate enough, and I don't know if you know this name, Aaron, um, uh, Angelo Sakopoulos. So Angelo Sakopoulos, he's a billionaire in Sacramento. He's, he's pretty much the largest land banker in the state of California. And oh. I was fortunate enough to become really good friends with one of, um, well, it's his nephew, his head of council. And so I got an insight into like their business and how they've done what they've done and their horizon when they make investments, it's through a paradigm of 50 years of this investment. And so it really is thinking about true generational wealth and legacy. But what they've done is so smart, exactly what this group in Phoenix is doing, which is they buy obviously all the dirt in areas and they're not looking for little infill stuff, you know, in the city or in certain neighborhoods that they can make a little, you know, uh, you know, hit on. They're looking for large plots of land that they can entitle and that's essentially what they do. They land bank it. They sit on it for 10, 15, 20 years. When it gets to the point where it starts making sense, there's a little bit of demand on it from you know development. Then they start entitling it to its highest and best use. They find a developer that they can partner with. They get cashed up front. They get a back end you know, portion of equity or something along those lines. And this guy has done nothing but buy dirt and entitle it and find partners. And he's a billionaire. So I love that as being a play for people that are at a, maybe a little bit different stage of their wealth building journey, but it being probably one of the best verticals of wealth preservation and giving you the most utility on how you want to utilize that in the later years of your wealth building journey, a strategy that I think a lot of people just completely neglect because it doesn't pay cash flow today. Mm. Fascinating. I love it. Um, yeah, really interesting conversation. I want to, I want to pivot to some new news that just dropped yesterday, um, and getting a little political and I want to kind of play this chess game out a little bit and see what you guys are thinking. Apparently Trump was barred from California's primary Colorado. ballot yesterday. Oh, sorry. Colorado. Um, Callie's next. Super fascinating. The court <laughs> says in Colorado that Trump engaged in the insurrection inciting January 6th. He, he is appealing this to the U.S. Supreme Court, which he actually had a lot to do with putting a, a few people on the court. So it could be actually in his favor. Um, but it makes him eligible to serve as U.S. president. Super fascinating. Our boy Vivek said that if they if they ban him, then he's also withdrawing, which I thought was an interesting move by Vivek. And the comments on Twitter, the comments online are really in support of that. I want to just go around the table and see what you guys are thinking. Where does this end up? Does this matter, Mike? What's what's the real skinny here and what's going on? Uh, Mooch, let's start with you. Man, I think... Um, I Sorry, Mooch. What what does this mean for America in the big picture? Remember the old Pearl Harbor quote that was like, "Japan says, wait, I think we might have awakened a sleeping giant type stuff." Like the like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have bombed the U.S. because they were going to stay out of stuff. I don't know why. Like, I don't know why they would do that. Like, what were they thinking? Like, what were they thinking this in the sense that like, um, what's going to rile people up more? Like, so the people that hate Trump hate him already. Right. They're they're like celebrating. But the people like in the middle that are trying to weigh the back and forth that essentially don't want government to make the choice for them. I think it helps Trump in other places. I think it looks petty. Um, I think, you know, I think Vivek is trying to get the, the VP nomination there. Mm -hmm. uh, I really hope that he wants to get that and he keeps pushing uh, for that because, yeah, I want to be able to say that I talked to a vice president on our podcast. Um, 
And so what's it mean for America? It it's like it's it looks as bad as the games that Trump was doing on the other side after the election of trying to like stop the you know when he's when he's asking Pence not to not to validate the election or when they're going back and doing the recounts. Mind you, my personal belief is that I do think that some of the recounts should have been done because I think a bunch of shady stuff happened. At the same time, it didn't play out right. So I don't know. I think that it's uh, I think it's bad business to say this person can't run for president. Um, it creates uproar and upheaval. Colorado went to a uh, went blue in 2020. Colorado went blue in 2016. I don't think it matters for the outcome of the election. Like it's also like mm-hmm. not a surprise. I was just trying to pull up because part of me remembered that Colorado was a red state in 2016, but it wasn't. It, it, it was blue in 2016, blue in 2020, so now it's going to be blue in 2024. So who cares? Um, but uh, but it's stupid. I think it's stupid, but I think what it does is it is it plays out to that idea of people want to be able to vote for who they want to vote for. I think it, it was going to rile up and bring more Trump supporters. A lot of people thought said Trump won the first one because so many people hated Hillary, right? There were people that came out and voted because they didn't want Hillary to get elected, right? And the and so many people came out and voted for Biden because they didn't want Trump to get elected. So it's like it's like does the opposite. Like negativity can do the opposite. So yeah, I think it's. For America, I think it sucks. I think it's bad uh, press. And it's the Supreme Court in Colorado, too. So I don't know if there's actually a way to overturn that because the, because it's a state saying this is how they're going to run their own elections. States are allowed to decide how to run their own elections. So I don't think there's a process for somebody to go through now and appeal it. I think it's it. I think that that's it. No, he's appealing it. Mm. It's it, he, He's appealing it. It's already in the Supreme Court. Um, yeah, but they just said I mean, the Supreme I, Court of Colorado won it. Like, was it? So correct. now it's good. So you're saying that the Supreme federal Court? U.S. Supreme Court he's can take, can correct. appeal it. Yep, yep. And it's already there. You know, you know, he's already got that one in motion. I think I agree with you. I mean, Colorado, and if they did it in California, right? Like, it's those things don't make a difference in those types of states. However, it makes a difference in the sentiment and the integrity of the system and the, and the country. Right. When you when you start silencing political opponents, especially political opponents who are massively winning in a very big public way right now, to me, that's a really dangerous precedent to send. Because when you think about it, I saw this post today and I, I just saved it. No matter how you feel about January 6th, what you, you know, ultimately believe to be true or not true, here are some actual statistics and facts right now. Right now, as of today. Trump has never been convicted of the word, which is ultimately what they keep throwing around as all the reasons for why they're doing what they're doing, which is insurrection. So he was not convicted of insurrection. No one actually in January 6th, if you look at all of their court documents and what they were convicted of, were actually convicted of insurrection. Trump was never charged with insurrection. And no one involved in January 6th was charged with insurrection. He was acquitted on his second impeachment on charges that related to the events of January 6th. Again, no formal charge or conviction of insurrection. And the 14th Amendment in, I think they put section three dot whatever, does not apply to the president. So when you think about all the Mm -hmm. stuff that they're trying to do, all the loopholes, one, every time they've sent this dude to court, all he's gotten is more popular and or the people on the left that are somewhat moderate and in the middle are going, this is not how our, the weaponization of our government and our justice system should be utilized. So Mm -hmm. therefore, even though they don't like Trump, they don't like that even more. So they're starting to fall further in the middle. So I think it's actually working against them. But then when you think about, I saw somebody else post this today, This is how slippery this slope can get. If Colorado is taking Trump off the ballot for the reasons that they're taking him off the ballot for, why can't Florida and Texas take Biden off the ballot? Right? He allowed all of these. It's a domino. It's a first domino. Illegal, you know, immigrants to come into America, right? And do things that are against our constitution. You think about what some of their political policies and plays have been and how one state that may not agree with that goes, mm, we can find a loophole for that 
this is our political opponent and enemy of this state and where we stand currently today, which is a red state. Therefore, now we're going to start attacking any blue. That's that totally erodes the fabric of democracy and why we do what we do the way we do it and why it's worked for so long. Now you start doing this kind of stuff. And now all of a sudden you start sounding like you're, you know, in Russia, right? Putin did exactly this with 20,000 troops. He set up a barbed wire fence, installed himself as president after a rigged election. Then he sent the KGB to raid his opponent's home and he arrested him four times. And guess what? Dude's still in power and he runs a communist country. You start going down that path and those feel very similar. Now they could be very different in context. But when you look at what he did and ultimately the attack that they have on this political opponent in Trump from the existing organization and administration, it's very similar in a lot of ways. They can paint it up and put lipstick on you know, the pig however they want. But again, I feel like we go down this path, it's going to be a really slippery slope, claws start coming out, and it's going to be ugly. And ultimately, the people who get screwed in this whole process are us. Right. It's not yeah. all these politicians that are playing politics with our lives and, you know, the global economy. It's us humans that get screwed over by this. So this is a really dangerous ploy, in my opinion. I think it's only going to help Trump. And ultimately, I think if it doesn't get tightened up quick, it's going to get very catty. And we're going to see more and more weaponization of the justice system and all the loopholes you know, corrupt politicians who want to stay in power and continue lining their pockets can find in order to get the results and outcomes that they desire. That was brilliant, Matt. Lots of really good points you dug into there and you took it to places I hadn't even even thought about it with some of that that backing. So the very, very, very well done uh, on that. I like well, that. Well, thank you, sir. Mikey? Yeah, I'll jump in. <clears throat> um, I don't have much more to add after uh, Maddie's eloquent diatribe and opened my eyes to a lot more. But what's interesting back to what Aaron was saying, and it kind of compounds on what Maddie was saying, we were talking about this on the drive home the night before last night. It was my daughter's birthday and we were coming home from dinner. And, and I don't know, Karen and I started talking about this whole situation. And my 23-year-old son said, we need freedom. And... What, what wow. Aaron was saying, and, and then Maddie kind of, you know, like further reinforced this. The thing, as that conversation was going on, I was just listening to what was happening in the car. And I think, again, just kind of reiterating what Aaron said, what's, what's dangerous about what Colorado did, um, and you said it so right, if somebody's far left, they're not going to vote for Trump anyway. But I think what's happening, like my 23-year-old son opening his eyes and saying, that's not right. Even though he probably doesn't have a real concept around, you know, the constitution and all of that, this is opening people's eyes, everyday Americans to like, okay, what is, what does amendment 14 really say? I wonder, I'd want to buy stock in little books like this because mm. like literally that's our constitution. It isn't like some, you know, this isn't some complex, but how many people are looking at, you know, the 14th amendment and saying like, what does that actually mean? And, and like my son saying, we need freedom, meaning the other side of that conversation is he feels like he is in a place that is losing freedom. And mm -hmm. I actually, through that conversation, what I was grabbing behind me, I told Kara that night, I said, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm reading Atlas Shrugged again this year. I'm putting this on my list of things to read again, because I mean, as big as this book is and, and anybody in the audience that hasn't read this, like digest this thing. Um, but I'm going to read this again this year because... We're in a really unique spot. And the comment that I made that night was, you know, we are the longest standing democracy that has existed um, all the way back. And freedom is like, we're on the precipice of going to what Maddie was talking about with Russia and keeping democracy alive. And I would bet to say that if you polled Americans and said, do you love democracy? The majority of them that understand for democracy of what it is, or even their perspective of it would say, yes, we live in the greatest country that has ever existed. And I'm not saying that because I'm an American, like truly this is a experiment. This is the American experiment of democracy. And what does it really mean? 
And we are on the precipice of being able to lose all of that in the next 10 to 20 years. And so I think things like this are probably inciting the average American to wake up and say, what does the Constitution really mean? What does it say? And to read things like this, Atlas Shrugged, and to open their eyes. And so I actually think that, you know, this might be an awakening of everyday Americans, not just this, but the things that have happened the last 10, 15 years. And if we don't wake up, it's what Vivek was saying on our podcast. Go back and listen to that episode if you're listening to this. And this is why Vivek is like so amazing in my mind because he doesn't give a shit. And he wants people to really wake up to like that optimism that he still had and he expressed in that podcast with us, you know, six or eight weeks ago was like really empowering to me, but it takes people to wake up and say, okay, is this right? Is this wrong? And open our eyes to like, what does the constitution really mean? And I said this a while back, you know, our founding fathers could not have experienced or, or imagined a day where if you transported them to, you know, 300 years later or whatever it was that we're going to be up against what we're up against. And it's so brilliant what they did and mm -hmm. and what they put into place and the fact that we live in the greatest country where the Supreme Court of Colorado can actually make a decision like this, yet there's a higher court that has to answer for that. So I actually, this just, this just further reinvigorates me in our system, our constitution, the democracy we live in, it gives me hope. And ultimately at the end of the day, the way that it was set up, um, the people get to speak. And I said this the other night and Kara said, do we though? like because of our election process, but that's why the court system exists. The unfortunate part is, you know, it can take years to get through these kind of things. And, um, you know, that's where the challenge lies, but also show me a better system as frustrated as certain people are, show me a better country, mm -hmm. show me a better way. And, and I think you'd be hard pressed to find it, but we have to fight for it because again, I think we could be on the precipice of losing what could be the greatest, you know, experiment that's, that's ever, ever existed. And so, I love what Aaron and Aaron, um, um, Maddie said. And at the end of the day, like, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful that, you know, we have the opportunity to be able to do this. Cause if we lived in Russia or we lived in Britain or we lived in some of these even free countries, they don't have the system that we have. And so I'm excited. The last thing that I want to say really quick, um, Aaron, we all, want, we're all jumping in. We all want to jump in. Uh, your comment on Vivek, I think, is interesting because somebody put in our thread the other day that, you know, our boys play in chess. And it's so true, whether he wants to be the vice president and he supports Trump, great. Um, but number two, if Trump is ousted and cannot be the president for whatever reason, if I'm Trump and we all know Melania loves Vivek, um, then maybe I say, hey, I'm going to throw my backing behind this guy. And so I think he's just brilliant for for what he did there in Colorado. Because to your point, Aaron, it doesn't matter for him. He's probably it's not going to get the nomination. Out. Yeah, it's a win for him. So brilliant, 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 Vivek. He's brilliant. He's doing everything he can to stand out. I'd like to switch topics, but anybody want to put a just a, a, a tab well, on what I, Mike I, said there? No, I think this is super fascinating. I think you guys all shared some really good thoughts. I think that if... There, there was a podcast I was listening to. Um, LeBron James got a bunch of feedback the last couple of weeks. I don't know if you guys followed this, where he didn't stand up at a national anthem. And the podcast I was specifically listening to was just basically like bashing him. Okay. And I think that there is a group of Americans that feel maybe it's a victim mindset. I don't know what quite it is, but people that feel like our country is terrible. We sh we're not proud of being an American, but I actually feel like uh, more than 50% of people do not believe that that's true. I think a majority of people, just like what Mike said, are proud of this country that want to defend it, that understand it's fragile, that are proud to live here, that are willing to put their neck life on the line to protect what we have, are willing to do the work and and when when these kind of th when these types of things happen this is not the population communicating this this is a small majority of elite folks that are driving decisions like this and i think Maddie, you said this too is that this is not just people that are far right saying oh my god what's going on i think people are in the middle people on the left are saying is this really where we want our country to go where a handful of people create these little fences and rules that take away our ability to vote. And even if we don't believe that maybe our vote really counts, you're still taking away the little power we have by doing shit like this. 
And so I, I think that if it's not this cycle, it's one or two cycles away, we are going to see significant changes in the way that things happen in this country. I do not believe that this power has much legs one, two, three cycles away from this. But I think people are waking up, whether you're listening to this or you're listening to Patrick Big David or Elon or Joe Rogan or wherever you're getting information from, the reason why these people are be, are successful and they have a voice and they have influence is because they're bucking the status quo. This is where people mm-hmm. want to start learning what's really going on, what you know, what's really happening on the ground level. Um, and and I've and I've shared this on this podcast too. It's like it's sort of the first time I'm engaging in these types of conversations, and it pisses the shit out of me, right? And so I think I think that we're not in the minority here. Um, regardless of whether you're left or right. So yeah, let's take I mean, our freaking country wanna, back, I, man. Get involved. Yeah. Read read I'll, what you need to read. Go to the sage and get some guidance on books. Read the freaking constitution. I think our boy, Vivek, the reason why he gets so much traction is he makes all this complexity super simple. Yeah, He makes like all this nuance, all this bureaucratic political bullshit and saying, well, actually, the president doesn't have the right to do that, so I'm not even going to promise that. Or it's really this amendment that they're going after, and let me explain to you what this amendment says. I think that education, that interest is – I don't know why, if, if it was ever lost or not, but it's becoming more mainstream for Mike to flash the Constitution and say, hey, like, we should read this. We can understand this. And – Kids coming into voting age are curious about these things. And I think all of that is positive. Maddie, take us home and Mooch. Yeah, my my final it. thought, and I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Mooch, is there's a key word that I have been hanging my hat on the last three years post-COVID, and it's that more and more people are waking up. And waking yeah. up meaning we're just <laughs> not taking shit at face value anymore. And, and, and 2020 validated that you can't. Right. Like you can't take what the government is telling you at face value. You can't take what the media is telling you at face value. You can't take what the pharmaceutical companies are telling you. You just can't anymore. And so now this awakening based on that one massive black swan event has more and more people asking that same question of where else am I? asleep right now in my life? Is it in my business? Is it in my marriage? Is it with my health? Is it with our politics, right? More and more people are asking questions. Maybe they're right, Mm -hmm. maybe they're wrong, but they're asking more questions instead of taking everything at face value. And I'm a big believer that the questions we ask, the answers that we get are determined by the quality of the questions we start asking ourselves. And so I also think the one thing that the government, the world order, whatever you want to say, how they set policy in response to the global pandemic, they underestimated the power of human intuition and our guts. And I think more and more people felt their spidey senses tingling and they leaned into that. And even though they got maybe names thrown at them or their conspiracy this or whatever that as time played out, and their intuition and their gut was actually validated in a lot of ways. I'll just say more than half the population, okay? We'll say more people than less people were feeling like something was off. They didn't necessarily feel aligned or safe or secure with the decisions, the path, the policies that were coming out as a result of that. And they made a decision. And that decision was validated in some way, shape, or form, whether they did something or they didn't do something they were validated. And now as time has played on, I think more and more people are waking up to these things and asking these types of questions and how they can shape the next generation of the world. So the question around democracy, I think is very interesting, right? We're over here fighting a war in Ukraine around saving their democracy. But when you really do some digging, Ukraine is not Our a democracy is a risk. country. When you think about Zelensky right now has absolute control over the Ukrainian media. Most people don't know that. He outlawed oppositional political parties and Ukraine's Orthodox Church, viewpoints different than his and his administration. He declared martial law. Look it up. 
and he uses absolute power under martial law. Now he's throwing out canceling elections. We're in a war. Too dangerous. We can't give the people the right to choose. This is not a safe time to do that. Is that a democracy? Is that what we're actually throwing billions of our hard-earned dollars behind to go and save to fight against this bad, bad, bad Russia? Not saying Russia is great, right? But so more and more people are starting to ask questions and waking up, and I'm excited for that. Okay, you know, I just got the, really scared by the fact that we're only on YouTube per Aaron's recommendation because if we get canceled at some point in time, it's our only outlet. I'm just, I'm just saying. And what we're talking the about last is thing, worth being canceled for. Ma yeah, I agree, Maddie. You said something in the last episode of the one before. You said, and you just dropped it in passing. But you said awake is better than woke. And I was just like, I've been thinking about that based on so you know, just what you just said. Like, that was such a good, I even went to see if that was trademarked because that was good, brother. Like, and it's so true. It? It's, it's, um, no. Aaron's like, no, I'm gonna, but I'm going to do I'm it. I'm going to buy the dot com right now. Awake is <laughs> better right now. <laughs> Go, I'm, I'm on go, daddy. First space first. The, I got to say for our you listeners out there, you guys are so freaking lucky to be a part of this. And I don't want to sound like an ass, but I've been a part of a lot of pod calls, a lot of groups, a lot of masterminds. And I pretty much don't show up for any of my other pod calls anymore. You know, the, because they don't provide the amount of value that I get here. I thought this was a nothing burger. Uh, when it came out, I thought this was a no, who cares about this news? And you guys have shown me that I really need to actually look into it more, do some more research and care some more. I thought it absolutely didn't matter. Colorado has been blue. Who gives a shit if Trump's not on their ballot? I see that you guys are obviously more pat. I'm renaming Mike the Patriot instead of the Sage because he got <laughs> the cash and Maddie so fired up. Maddie said, hey, give me one sec. Give me one minute and I'm going to wrap this up. And then 19 minutes My later, bad. Maddie's like, OK, I'm almost <laughs> done. I'm going to hand it back. You guys are rad as we get to have these combos. I am going to go look in to more of that. It's really funny. And Civil War era law in that little booklet. Um, and as I start to, I'm going to shift to a couple of quick little topics here. But as, as Mike held up the Constitution and he held up Atlas Shrugged, I'm going to be adding Atlas Shrugged to my deal too. Because I'd, I'd made a post yesterday about how this developer in New York is pretty much getting foreclosed on and getting put out of business only because of government intervention. Because they said he could no longer raise his rental rates after he had rehabbed the property, that they weren't letting him collect rent and they weren't letting him, him evict. And it's a $114 million portfolio that was run really, really well that's getting foreclosed on because of government intervention. And a couple of the quotes, a couple of the comments I got back on my feed on it was like Atlas Shrugged. It was like, hey, and then a lot of the comments I got on TikTok were from people saying no one should own $114 million in properties anyway, and they were glad about it. So it's like, we have this strange... Thing going on so the atlas shrugged reminded me um of that um our, as our youtube page is, is blowing up we had our buddy kurt said can maddie show his flowing golden hair more in these videos and i put on I my reply i said before we started recording i talked about i dyed my hair to look more like maddie uh, so i don't have yeah. the long you know locks yet but i'm sure blonde now everybody so the now you see it first on our youtube page yeah. glad that you guys I think could it's be a, good a part of you, that bro. I, yeah, like the, I said it. I told everybody well, I want to be more like Maddie. And those are the conversations are your, we're having on the comment. What are your kids saying? Uh, uh, what's Kalina saying? What's everybody else around you saying? What's your feedback? Izzy does not like it and begs me to dye it back. Like a lot. Like texts me. So like, like begs me. Prays for it. That's all she wants for Christmas. <laughs> everybody else, the reactions have been exactly what I was hoping for. Like everybody else's reactions were like shock and awe and happiness and fun. And so I love um, it. Soaked on it. Mikey, you, you, you want to talk about my hair or what do you want to talk about? No, I want to talk about my hair and the inspiration from Maddie because a good friend of ours just went to Mexico and got implants. And so <laughs> if it works out, um, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, dude, I'm also going to do that. Did he send you the video? I have gotten hair implants. Yeah. Dude, our, our buddy that did it last week, he sent me the video and he his hair, his really. head is all ripped up right now, but he's pumped. That's yeah. So next year, this time, Mike's going to have a super long, super long hair, not a comb over. There yeah. we go. And I'm going to, I'm going to let it all go. And one, like eight seconds. This is the freedom comment. conversation we're having right after we just, what we just talked about. Yeah. No, hair I'm, is, I'm going to go to other countries to do this. You can't do it in yeah, the US. Use, the it's the benefit right. of countries that don't have laws is you can actually get hair plugs. Yeah. So <laughs> back, back to the freedom conversation, and this will be eight seconds. 
the the Boston Tea Party, and this is what it's really going to take. Like they 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 staged a revolt and dumped a bunch of tea in the bay for like a three percent tax, and that's like that's what that's what it's going to take for us to get back to. Yeah, so I have five more seconds. That's what it's going to take for us to get back to because, like, the things that really matter, we're not paying attention to. That was over a three yeah. percent tax. So anyway, yeah. done. All because right, we're sleeping. More fun real. investment real estate topic. We got it. We're an hour and ten minutes in, and we've hit two topics, guys. I want us to at least get to one more. Maybe we'll get to two as we can jump in. But again, you guys are again. You're. Fa it's fascinating that we get to have these conversations. You we're guys fired up about me. it. Like you guys are fired up about something that I thought was not news. So the, so shame on me. Um, I wasn't, I didn't care enough about that. Maybe I'm not as American as you guys. The, let's see, can I share <laughs> my screen? I'm going to share. Yeah. You didn't even know about Vivek until we brought him to you. Look at that. The dude, I, I thank you for, for bringing <laughs> Vivek into my life. All right. Big news of the week for me, for my, you know, you guys know how much I love Vegas, but the, Hey, a new casino opened the fountain blue casino but there's a whole lot of history about the fountain blue that i think we should talk about i'm gonna go stay there in a couple of weeks to see if it's any good but it got foreclosed on back mm -hmm. in 2009 right it was so crazy so it got foreclosed on stopped construction and there's a couple of really cool things about that i remember seeing it when it was getting built i remember seeing the hall because 2009 i started buying foreclosures and by 2010 i actually had some extra play money and so when i went to vegas 2010 it, my life was a little bit different and i got to see that out there and that's when i actually started playing uh in vegas a lot but the so that thing got bought so the so back in 2000 so first it gets foreclosed on 2009 when everything was like screwed in the world this is part of why i was thinking about this whole land banking concept the carl icon bought the fountain blue out of foreclosure for 150 million dollars in 2009 but here's what he did next like at that time nobody could make 150 million work right and he stripped the building bare and I heard that he sold the interior parts of the building for 150 million. So he reduced his basis to zero within a year by selling some of the fixtures and things that were installed inside. Because when they build those buildings, even though the top isn't done, they start putting in finishes and stuff on the first floor. So he sold out whatever finishes he could. So by 2010, he owns this thing. He's paying property taxes on it, but he doesn't really have any other basis. And then he sells it in 2017 for 600 million dollars oh baby the crazy part so like so he did great right well what's that roi if you get all of your money back the first year and then make 600 million bucks he was buying that at a time when nobody could make that asset work but he figured out a way to make that asset work so super impressive deal the way that thing worked out and the and so now it's finally coming to fruition also in 20 so we've got a couple of things that we're going to hit here that I, as i bring it back to ash also back in 2017 right a group came to us and they said, hey, we want to try to uh, build, we want to try to essentially um, buy Fountain Blue and build it. And they came to us with this pitch deck. And they're like, this is going to be a CEO of the casino. This is going to be another guy. This is going to be our guy that gets us funding. And they came to us because we had our little hedge fund at the time. And they're like, we're looking for a two or three million dollar investment to essentially so fun to fund them to go do the reports and do the things to go get the bank right? To go get the lending, to raise the money. Essentially, they're like, hey, we're a startup. We're going to take over Fountain Blue. We need to raise like two or three million bucks. And as a result, we would give you guys like a half a percent of the deal. And I remember thinking, you want us to come up with a hundred percent of the money to fund you. And we would end up owning like a half a percent of the thing. But it was so outside. I'm sure that's actually the way business is done, but so outside the norm. But so Ashish, what do you think about the Fountain Blue? What do you know about this thing? Because I think it's an example of an amazing, amazing land banking investment. The concept of looking at an investment may be different than anybody else has. The way that maybe now I'm looking at some of the Austin properties too. Like, can I buy them? Can I gut them and hold them for a while? You know, what can you do in the meantime? But but you're but it hits you closer well, to home, think, right? I don't think I have anything to add from a strat real estate strategy perspective than what you just said. You know, I think what we said in the beginning segment of this podcast was this: is that there's going to be distress in certain categories and how you position yourself and your team and how to find win-wins, I think is where most of the wealth in the next five or seven years is going to be generated. This deal specifically, when I got into the business, this deal was, it, it went into bankruptcy. They didn't even close the windows. This was a steel structure that went bankrupt. It was like a, whatever, 30-story building in the heart of Vegas, just sitting there. 
and sat there for years, probably four, five, six years, never closed. So I'm not sure exactly what here, how he sold it, because I don't remember it ever being completely closed. Anyways, we did the furniture for this hotel. And we did it uh, early 2023. We shipped and delivered everything, and the hotel just opened last week. So I, like Mooch, am excited to go there and visit and party a little bit and enjoy enjoy what we did as a participant of that that order. It was one of the biggest orders we've ever done. Uh, super beautiful product. They did not cheap out. They hired all the best consultants and the best product and design and quality. It's just uh, bar none right now in Vegas. So I'm excited. They've done great marketing. Um, their Instagram is amazing. Like it really it does speak to the Fountain Blue brand. But just generally speaking, yeah, so I'm excited about it. I think it's a really great thing for us to have in our hat too that we were participating in that project. But I think there's going to be, you know, if you just talk about office, like, my God, how much distress is there in office right now? If you don't have vision, you got to have vision to try to figure out how to turn these assets and find the opportunities, take people out of these um, these values they want to get rid of and and get five, six, 10x returns like Carl Icahn did. So that's what I think is going to be fun. You know, if you're listening to this, you're going to, you know, you just need to try to figure out how to get that done and stop. You know, it just goes back to everything we're talking about is buck the convention, buck what everyone else is telling you, find creative alternatives. Um, so that's what I think we're talking about. So I'm in, I, get, I love it. I get so pumped that you did the furniture on it. And it thinks back to like that $10 million class A office that sold for 30 bucks a foot in Dallas. Could somebody buy that, actually strip it for parts, lower their basis to nothing uh, while they wait? Cause now it's a $3.7 billion casino. So bought for 150 million, then sold for five or 600 million and then sold again in like 2017 when they started the next, uh, uh, I mean, can you imagine duration. if you bought that for six hundred million in seventeen, and then COVID happened? I mean, can you imagine the stress and the fear and like, I mean, MGM and like all these oh, yeah. casinos were like just ninety percent down. Not a single person could go through these doors. MGM was like, like tinkering with bankruptcy. That's why it's taken and forever. It's That's insane. why the whole thing's taking forever, right? Oh, just yeah. speak to how you, like, you just gotta keep playing the game. Yeah. If you look um, in Elon's uh, book that just came out, he was talking about how in his first business, I forget what it was called, but he had like $1,200 or something like that in the bank. And then the next day got a VC deal funded and had 300 million in the bank. And when you look at guys like that, um, you know, and, and Elon talks about how in there too, you know, he always knew that he was either going to be very wealthy, happened to be the wealthiest man in the world now, or he was going to be flat broke. And it takes those kind of people um, that don't actually care about money. And this is where people have it so wrong. The the person that Aaron was yep. talking about earlier that made the comment, like nobody should own 114 million of, of properties. But what they don't understand is that those people don't actually care about money. They care about purpose and and the mission and, and getting shit done. And, and this is a great example of that. And I had to just kind of correlate that to Elon because it takes a set of like freaking steel balls that most people have or don't have to do something like what you were talking about, Ash, like, can you imagine, as you said, like the fear that went into that? And the last thing that I have to say, um, King's episode live at the Fountain Blue in Vegas with a VIP experience of Ash, like, um, you know, touring the the facility and the furniture Done. that he built. 2024. Yes, now we're talking. Yeah. yeah. Especially if it's your furniture, we're sitting on stuff. Maddie, anything about Fountain Blue? No, I mean, I think it, that that I read that article a while back and it, it just reminds me, right? Like for mo 99 out of a hundred people that looked at that deal were like, this thing's a turd, man. We can't do nothing with this. Yeah. But one, but one person not only had a vision, but they had the cojones to take action on that vision. And it just reminds me of what you say a lot, Aaron, right? Is, you know, we're all in many ways, very similar. And yet it's a very, small degree of difference between somebody who goes and has a $600 million exit and somebody who doesn't. And that one person had a vision, they took massive action, they followed through on their plan. And those are the people that are, are, are needle movers, right? And so just for anybody that's listening, it's, it's continuing to create awareness and develop 
the skills and get reps at building that type of mindset on being somebody who can see opportunity when everybody else overlooks it, that is a beautiful skill set to develop. And whether that's in tech, that's in real estate, that's in businesses, that's in the stock market, when you look at the people who have either made massive changes and innovations in the world or made massive changes in their own family trees and generational wealth, it's opportunity finders and it's people who know how to take action. And so I just, I love that story because that's one at the highest of levels. And yet where every single day do we as human beings fall into the category of being one of those 99 people that don't see opportunity or don't take action on it. And therefore we don't get those results. Try and be that one out of a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. The guy, I mean, he saw a way to make money on that business. So other people couldn't, he had like, it was like, no, no one, everyone said, no, it's Brilliant. not worth that as a development. He goes, well, what if we got it? The, it reminds me too, when, when Blackstone came out to, and they were like, Hey, we're going to start this rental fund in 09 and why, I didn't think why I thought that was a nothing burger when I could have done something with it is they told me ahead of time. And I said, you're not going to be able to good. You're not going to be able to get good rental returns here. Like it, that only rents for 1300 bucks and you're buying it for 400,000. That doesn't, doesn't make sense. It's not going to work. But what I didn't know was they were going to buy everything and push the prices up to 600,000 instead of 400,000. It wasn't going to be that. So they knew they had a plan to make money in a different way than was that traditional way. Ashish wrap up the uh, fountain. I have, loop I have one more on. additional thought on this. I think that another thing that may have happened that we don't know and is probably impossible to measure, okay? And I would say that everyone on this call thinks this way, but when you behave a certain way in business, whether it's how you run your company or how you are an investor, how you deal with brokers, how you deal with counterparties, banks, etc., when there is opportunity and the people that have their fingertips on those opportunity they want to bring it to people that are likely to be easy to work with and enjoy working with them. And I, and I heard this comment somewhere in the last week or so about, um, I think actually it came from Charlie Munger. I can't remember now, but you know, there are people that look at deals, let's call it in real estate or even in purchasing, they always are trying to find a penny, like trying to, trying to grind people always, always like, Oh, I'm going to get a better discount. I'm gonna get better at this. Well, when there's a really great opportunity, do you think that the broker is, you're going to be the first phone call for that broker? They're going to want to call somebody who is, pays a fair price, that lets people make money, that's easy to work with. And maybe, and I don't know anything about this guy, Carl Icahn, we're talking about this, but just from a principal perspective, I think about that from how you conduct yourself in transactions and how you behave. You know, Maddie says all the time, and I've learned this from Maddie, it's like, how do you find the win-win? Because if, if that's not helping you get a good deal today, I can guarantee you in 10, 12, 15, 20 years when there is distress, a huge opportunity, and maybe sometimes the broker will give you the vision and implant that vision. That, Listen, Mikey, I love you. You're, you're easy to work with. You took care of me 15 years ago. There's an unbelievable opportunity. You may not know how to get there, but let me draw you the path. And because you treated me so well, here's the deal in your lap. Go. You know, the, and the I, reason I why Carl Icahn maybe got that call in 20, whatever, 2011 is not because he did a good job in 2011. It could have been because he did a really great job in 1995. That's, that's a great yeah. point. And it drives home such a, Maddie always talks about, does the audio match the video? And it drives home such a great point, Ash, because, you know, if you look at, I mean, even the McDonald's story, when McDonald's was struggling in the early days and and they owed Coke a bunch of money and, and Coke stuck by them. And now Coke is like, you know, they'll never part from Coke. It's, it's those exactly. periods of time, like how we deal with adversity and, and the challenges. Not everything's rosy. And the last thing that I want to say too, um, it's capitalism at its core. Again, yeah. back to the person that made the comment, like, you know, nobody should own $114 million worth of property. But this, this is a great example of the good that is done and also how you frame that. Because when you walk into a boardroom of a venture capital company or a big private equity group and you're Car Carl Icahn and it's just a pitch deck, it doesn't matter. But when you have a relationship and they know your track record and they know you're going to see it through and the vision that you're selling, that matters so much more. And I was just thinking, look at the good that has came of this, not just for the Fountain Blue, but Ash on our call. 
Like capitalism at its core is something that we have to fight and battle for. And there's so many people that think it's like the evil capitalist goes back to Atlas Shrugged. But look at the downward effect of everything that happens there for the economy in Vegas and how many jobs it creates. And look at what it did for Ash's company. I have no idea what that figure was to put furniture in the fountain blue, but look at how many jobs that created, not just for the US, but for China and Mexico and Ash's employees. And the downward effect of capitalism is is huge in a positive perspective. So there has to be a mindset shift. But again, I love that point that you drove home because you can't just walk into a room with a pitch deck and expect it's the 99 that didn't get funding, but whatever he saw and believed in there, it was such a bigger vision that people probably couldn't help but to say, oh my God, this guy believes in it and he's got a track record and we believe in him. It's not really, how many times do you hear, I heard it this morning on a call with an investor, I'm not betting on the horse, I'm betting on the jockey. It's an old cliche term, but it just reinforces what Ash is saying. But that's the truth. That actually is what happens. It is the truth. I was literally on a call with a sovereign wealth fund, multi-billion dollar Korean sovereign wealth fund last week. And the main committee guy that leads it, to your point, Mike, said two things. He goes, all we underwrite and care about is two things. And really, it's just one. We look at sponsor first. We look at deal second. And really, we won't even look at the deal unless we believe in the sponsor, their vision, and their track record. If, if they don't mm. pass that test, we're not even going to look at the deal. It could be the best freaking deal on planet Earth. But if we don't like the sponsor, we're not going in. You know, I got, I got to buy the Roddy company because of that, right? So the, I was a customer, I reached out to them, tried to build my app with them, worked, you know, worked with the owners at the time for a while, invested some money, didn't go anywhere. Right. And then, and I was remembered being really bummed, but like, but I did, obviously did it. I obviously carried myself in a good, respectful way because once the owner passed away, I was the only person they reached out to, to buy the company. And when people found out that I got the chance to buy the company and I didn't have to bid against anybody else and it was quiet and it, like there were so many people that were super, super upset because they wanted to buy the company. They were interested in it. They had expressed interest in it. And it was all because of a relationship at the end of the day. They said, hey, Aaron's the one that we want to sell this to. And the and they didn't get it. They didn't even get another bid. Right. And it's been the, it's been one of the biggest, best investments ever that was because two three years prior i invested a lot of time brought my kid I, I remember bringing maddie into my meeting when i went and saw like like my my little I, she was young at the time right so the uh she's in the other room right now but she's probably like seven or eight years old when i br first bring her in to go introduce meet him for the first time i'm traveling with family but wanted to say hi and meet you guys in person while we're negotiating over the phone and anyway that stuff worked and that was i thought we were gonna get some more topics right? but you guys all talk way too much the, but the, well, that, you know, that so was life changing for you. I think that's a good reminder for anybody that's trying to create more abundance and wealth in their world is to truly think about. I consider myself a farmer. Every day I'm planting seeds, I'm watering and nurturing those crops. And at some point in time, I know that those crops will yield fruit that will, you know, be beneficial to me. But it's, it's a habit. It's a discipline. It's a way of being, right? Like you were building rapport and trust and relationship with that and not knowing if it was going to go anywhere, by the way. I'm sure when you started building those relationships, maybe that something could come out of it. Maybe you get, you know, some type of opportunity. Not way better than I could have imagined. Was, I was like, did you way ever think day it. one when you started adding that type of value, planting those seeds, nurturing that relationship and showing up that you'd end up getting you know, access, exclusive access to buy a company that is going to change your family tree forever? Probably not. And so nope. I think it's just really, it's a, such a cool point to remind people of, of how your actions every day are ultimately what are the seeds you're planting that are going to yield the fruit and the opportunity in the future. And you never know when that crop is going to yield fruit. But if you do it the right way and you're a student of the process and you're consistent with that process, there's no way around it. It might yield a Roddy's type of company opportunity, or maybe it lands you a twenty thousand dollar flip, and that funds you know a nice little uh, vacation and a part of your business. But you can't overlook that kind of stuff. So I just I love that being. I think all of us do that really well. Maybe without 
being super intentional and purposeful about it because it's who we are and it's a part of our kind of, you know, characteristics. But I think that's a quality and a skill that anybody can develop and should develop. And it's a, it's it's a, a good, good thing too. that that was not a real estate transaction because NAR would be on fire because that was collusion. <laughs> the, you know, there is, I, I think it's, it's really great points to think about how it happens at big levels. It happens at small levels. Anybody that I've ever coached in real estate too, they're like, the reason the lady sold us their house is because we were the nicest when we talked to them 10 years ago. And they finally came back to us. And the reason I got this listing was because they actually, I was the buyer's agent and they hated the other, their listing person that they actually had. You know, we will have plenty more time to talk about NAR, you know, next week as we're wrapping up the, I wanted to talk about Apple because I think Apple is actually one of those people that now they're getting sued and maybe they're getting their hands slapped a little when they're, they're the one that should be, you know, getting in trouble for, they should be getting in trouble like NAR. Frankly, there's a whole lot of stories. We'll get to talk about Apple maybe next time about the pros and the cons of people when they have control of everything. I think my final thought, and then would, you know, be open to hear just a final thought from everybody as we wrap in the next minute or two, you know, uh, as Mike was being his Patriot and he said, you know, we still live in the best country in the world because the stuff comes out in the wash. And I remember, I remember a time during COVID when so many people had expressed concerns that like, Hey, this is going to happen forever. And this is going to be illegal forever. And I remember thinking and telling people, no, it's going to come out in the wash, but the, but the lawsuits need to start essentially. And the lawsuits needed to start and they need to take their time, you know, to get through. And it need to be for people that got fired for the wrong reasons or military people or fire department people or, you know, just the planes on uh, the masks on planes and everything. Right. But when everything did get its cycle through, when it finally made it through all the court systems, you know, everything that we thought was right and fair was back to justify Like, no, people should get to make the choice. No, you can't shut people down for that. No, you can't inflict that on people. And so by the time it made it all through the courts and essentially that's what it, it eventually ended. It was finally like the lawsuits in the court saying, okay, it's over. Right. And then they're like, okay, it's over. So we do live in that place where a lot of times, more often than not, and more often than we'll see in other countries, the court system will go back and after sometimes it takes years and sort out what's fair. So I remember, you know, it's like mid 2022 and a lot of it sorted out. So I'm at beginning of 2023 on some of it thinking even more well assured that sometimes it takes time or proof and fairness and stuff to make its way through, but like, but you know, but it will make its way through the court. And I remember feeling even more confident after that, like, yeah, it took some time. We shouldn't have to go through all that bull that we did, but it worked itself out. Any final thoughts? The Let's start with Mikey in case he's got to jump off. Um, yeah, just kind of reinforcing what you just said, Aaron. I didn't find this article, but I saw something pop up, you know, in the last couple of weeks. The biggest source of new recruits for the military right now is unvaccinated soldiers that had issues before. And so that's just a, um, I didn't, I didn't verify that, but I just saw it pop up. I was just looking for it, but it reinforces what you're saying. Um, it will, we still live in the greatest country. It takes time for the process to work out, but that stat alone was just really interesting to me. It might take time, but you will be vindicated. Yep. Maddie. I am kind of working through today, f polishing up final 2021 goal or 2021, <laughs> 2024 goals. Um, Things take time in Maddie's world. Yeah. And I was, <laughs> um, I, I always set themes for every year. And my point of making this comment is for people to really think about setting a theme for their year, something that emotionally moves you and charges you. Mine for 2024 is go to war in 2024. And what I mean by that is I am going to war against my bad habits. I'm going to war against my limited beliefs and thinking. I'm going to war in business. I'm going to war on my health. I am going, because this last year was an interesting year, a cleanup year, a post exit year. And it was kind of a, a resetting the table and kind of refinding myself, reforecasting vision. Now that I'm clear on what that is, my theme this year is going to war and anything that stands in my path is going to have to face the wrath 
of me showing up to my best. And that's what I'm going to embody in every category of my life in this next year. So if you're setting your goals, being that we're at the, you know, the tail end of the year, um, I'd really encourage people to one, finalize those goals before the year starts. So that way you're clear on what you're pounding this, you know, the dirt on, on day one, but also find something outside of these goals, right. That, you know, we write down and those should inspire and motivate you. Also think about like a mantra. What is, what is a slogan? What is a theme that you can consistently refer back to as the lifeblood of what drives you in 2024? Minds go to war in 2024. I'd be curious to hear what your guys' are if we do have time. Um, but that being said, that's where I'm focused today and what I'm kind of wrapping up to head into the holidays on. Ash, bring us home. I love it, man. I, I don't want to get in the way of Maddie's war path. Um, I actually am using a little bit of a, a different analogy than Maddie, but I love, I've been at war and I feel like we sometimes need to be wartime leaders in our life, in our business. I feel like I'm playing offense on all fronts. That's how I'm playing. I'm, I'm using my analogies. Uh, I'm not playing defense. I'm not necessarily being patient. Um, if there's things in my life that I need to address, I'm playing offense. I'm taking action. I'm moving forward. That means a lot of balls are going to be juggling, but we're moving forward. So that's kind of the analogy of, of energy that I'm using. But such a great conversation. Um, I think for me today, the biggest takeaway is that in life, we have to learn how to be patient. We can't feel like, woe is me. These are only my problems and get lost in those issues, kind of standing that, you know, 30,000, 100,000 feet away sometimes and looking at the arc of history shows that just stay in the game sometimes will have positive um, direction. Just you staying in the game, not ne necessarily trying to get attached to outcome all the time, you can actually go up and right. And that doesn't necessarily mean just in money or wealth, but just in overall well-being, life, freedom, all of that. And so... I think that was probably my biggest takeaway today is like you have to fight for what you believe in and other people are not going to do that. And I think we're seeing a really big change. At least I see it in myself that we're tired of virtue signaling. I'm, I'm tired of myself doing that. And I think it goes back to what we're talking about. Virtue signaling is not the answer. We don't care about that. Being woke, I think, was a little bit of that. Um, but I'm just excited. I am proud of what we're creating here at the King's Table. This is in those value pillars that we're talking about today. I'm proud to share this time and this space with the three of you and all of our listeners and all the people that are engaging with us. I, I encourage everyone to continue to stay and engage and give us feedback and comment. And we really want to provide more and more value. And I just wish so much joy and happiness and success and abundance for everyone into the 2024 year and beyond. And we love everybody. Thank you guys so much um, for all of this. And to everyone listening, happy new year, Merry Christmas. Uh, love all of you guys. This from the King's Table. Thanks so much for listening. Peace. King's Table out. Happy holidays.